morning. Welcome back to... <coughs> Sorry. Whenever I believe there's a message for the church, then my voice seems to want to go. So uh, <coughs> just forgive me. It's happening in this church right now. You see, there are people here and in churches around the world who think because they've come to church, they get credit from God. Anybody feel that way? Yeah. Place of honesty. Put your hands up, people. <laughs> There are people in churches around the world today who, who believe that if I go to church, I get a point. Ding! If you've watched Laugh Fever, you know what I'm talking about. And we believe that when we hear the word spoken, we sing a couple of songs, throw a couple of rand into the, into the wooden box, that we've had a ta-da religious experience. And we leave here thinking, yes, we did our thing, we went to church, we're super spiritual, we're better than other people because other people are on the vol riding their boats right now, and we were in church. We feel good about ourselves. When you feel like that, James tells us very clearly in the first slide that we are deceiving ourselves. As Christ follows, we are deceiving ourselves. And he says this, he says, James 1.22, he says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, do what it says. James tells us that it's not good enough to listen to me preach on a Sunday or a day. What it says in real terms, or not doing what it says in real terms, is like not reading it at all. And millions of Christians around the church, around the world, sit in churches today and go, you know, he's right. I need to change. But they don't. Why do you come to church then? Why do you listen to what God tells you if you're not going to do what he says? It's a scary precept, people. It's scary when God starts to speak to you like this. Now, as a Christian, God expects you to live in the application of what he gives you. So God gave us this whole bunch of apps that we have, and he expects us to do those apps. He doesn't expect us to read the apps. He just wants us to do the apps. Because when we do the apps, our lives change. Do that for me with regards to, to this app, was this line that Dave said. He said, forgiven people forgive people. That line rocked my life. Because if you understand God's love, if you understand God's forgiveness in your own life, then it's going to be easy for you to forgive somebody else. But if you cannot grasp that God has forgiven you for everything that you've done, God loves you so much and he wants to pour his grace out into your life, he wants to do all of this, then you're going to struggle to forgive those who have hurt you. So this morning, I want to have a look at a connected app. It's an app that is absolutely connected to the forgiveness app. One can't will do, because firstly, it requires that I become honest with myself. It requires that I become honest with those who I've wronged. And this is very, very difficult, because we've spent a large amount of time in our lives convincing ourselves that what we have done isn't really all that bad. It doesn't need to be confessed, because seriously, it's not that big a deal. God says, <laughs> you got it wrong. It is a big deal. This whole confession issue is a huge, uh, um, huge deal. And I'm going to beat up on the Catholics a little bit this morning, not intentionally, but they were the original church. They gave us the, the models for confession. Be they right, be they wrong, that's up to you to ascertain. But I, I'm going I'm to talk about their understanding of confession a little bit. If you come from a Catholic background, well then, confession about it. And he would tell you, all your, you would tell all your sins to him, and he said, well, go and say 15 Hail Marys, play with your rosaries, do whatever you need to do, and you are forgiven. That's it. All sins are washed away, it's over and done with. Now, as Protestants, us Christians in the church, we think our system works a lot better. Why? Well, because we've got direct access to the throne of God. Not the Catholics don't, but we bypass me and we go straight to God with our things which is awesome that rocks okay so what happens is we we go through the day we sin our minds out our bucket is full we go to bed we climb into bed at night to take the bucket throw it out in front of us and go Lord forgive me for this forgive me for that forgive me for this forgive me for that forgive me <sighs> <All right. sighs> you know that's it we, we go and we sin our brains out again and we fill the bucket up and the next morning evening we climb back into bed and we start going forgive me forgive me forgive me forgive me, forgive me. I want to tell you something, and you may not like what I'm going to tell you right now, but you're not alone. 
in every denomination, in every religious structure. I don't care if you're AFM, Methodist, Catholic, Baptist, six, seven, eight day Adventist, they were witnesses. I don't care what you are. All right? We all have a way in our religious structure to try and con God into forgiving us. We play games with God when it comes to this conflict. And this is a scary piece that I'm going to tell you. But so many people seem to think that when I go to God and I ask him for forgiveness, he forgets about my sins. Yeah, the word tells us, I'll throw it into the sea of my forgetfulness. You know that piece of scripture? We seem to think that God forgets about our sins. God is not an idiot. He doesn't forget about your sins. He just chooses not to bring it up again. Okay, so what we do is now God has forgotten about my sin. So when I do it tomorrow, it's like the first time I've done it and God won't remember it. You know what it's... Uh, he remembers it. He's just not going to bring it up again. All right? Somewhere along the road, we thought that we can pull the wool over God's eyes. Somewhere along the road, we thought that we can abuse the gift of grace. And we still think like that today. Even as Christians, we seem to think like that today. I'll ask you a question. Truly, honestly, come before God and say, God, I am so sorry for what I have done that he will forgive you. All of us, most of us. If you don't, come talk to me afterwards because I need to tell you something. <laughs> all right? Okay, you believe that, all right? Who of you this, this, this morning believe that if I do the same sin over and over and over, but I'm honestly trying to put a stop to the sin, and I'm really, really seriously repenting of the sin, uh, but I, I'm, I'm struggling with it. Who believes that God will forgive that sin? I do. I'm talking about people who have addictions, for instance. People who, God forgives us, am I right? No, okay, awesome. Who of you believe that God forgives us and His grace is now a license to sin? No. So why are we going back to God every night with the same things over? And it's not the huge heroin addict type sins. It's the white lie, stealing pencils from the office type of sin. You can stop it. You're an adult. All right? But we go back to God. God, I'm so sorry for stealing this pencil. Hmm, another one for the collection. <laughs> Why? Why do we do that? In essence, Martin, so you don't have to deal with this issue when it comes to judgment. All right? But the thing is, when we do that, when we cheapen grace, when we go to God with these silly little sins that we know we can stop, but we keep asking God for forgiveness. When we go to him like that, we are not only sinning against the people we're stealing from or the people that we are hurting with our slander, gossip, blah, 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 whatever. We are sinning against God. I want you to turn with me. Slide number two, Galatians 6 verse 7. There's that word again. Do not be deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't be a moron. God cannot be mocked. I love this version. You know why I love the NIV version? Because some of the other versions say God will not be mocked. You know what that means to me? That God will be mocked. He's all powerful. He's all wise. He's all everything. So he's not going to get mocked. I don't care how clever you think you are. I don't care how sneaky you think you are. He's cleverer and he's sneakier than you are. Ever will be. And he will not, cannot, cannot be mocked. And then he goes on. Paul says, a man reaps what he sows. Paul is writing to the church of Galatia. They are messing up six love at this point. He is highly miffed with the church because they're just not getting it right. And he says to him, guys, listen to me. What you are trying to do with this piece of scripture, you're trying to manage God. You're trying to maneuver God into doing what you want him to do. And that's not going to happen. He tells them that if you don't stop this right now, there are going to be consequences. You will reap what you are sowing right now. You will have to deal with it because when you try to con God, when you try to maneuver God, when you try to outsmart God, what are you doing? You're mocking him. And he will not, cannot be mocked. So deal with whatever comes your way if you do not stop with this right now. It was a hard one. One of the things that we need to grasp this morning is that when we look at the the whole Catholic structure of, of, of confession, we need to understand that it isn't a biblical precept. Now, don't be shocked, because the Catholic Church um, only comes into play, this whole concept only comes into play 275 years after the Bible is canonized. The whole concept of the Rosemary's and the Hail Marys only comes into play 600 years after the death of Jesus Christ. 275 years after Constantine consecrates the, the Word of God into one book. 
So it's not a biblical precept to go to your priest, sit down in a box, play with your rosary, say a couple of Hail Marys, and you're absolved of all your sin. Okay? The whole concept of, of penance, and, and that is such a Catholic word, that penance, because it comes, within, from, comes from the Catholic Church. But it comes originally from the teachings of John the Baptist in the desert. Remember his sermon, Turn or Burn, Repent, for the time is near. You know that, that, that whole central message of John the Baptist before Jesus comes? The word penance comes from the word repentance. And there is a massive difference today between penance and repentance. And I want to read this to you because this is the definition I found of it. Penance is the attitude of penance can be externalized in the acts that a believer imposes on himself or herself. These acts themselves are called penances. In some of the more hardcore sects of the Catholic uh, tradition, there are people who whip themselves for the forgiveness of their sins. That's a penance. That act of whipping yourself is a penance. It's actually got nothing to do with repentance. It's putting yourself through something to attain forgiveness. The problem with the early church or the early Catholic church was this. That once you went to your priest, and get this, this is scary. Once you went to your priest, you couldn't go back to him again for the same sin. So if you confessed for lying, for instance, you could never go back to your priest and confess for lying. Because the church assumed that you got, got a hold of the sin. You've got it under control. You're not lying anymore. Now, does it sound like a system that works? It doesn't. It's a scary system. Let me put it into more real terms. Craig, I'm going to use you this morning. Craig, you go off to your padre, your Catholic minister, priest, priest, that's the word I'm looking for, and you ask him for forgiveness for swearing, okay? It's all done and dusted. Your swearing is all forgiven. How's that going to work for you, you think? It won't. Let me use me. You know, I never use me as an example, but Andre. I go over to my pastor and I ask for penance for my temper. Because believe it or not, I do have a temper every now and then. Um, it's done and dusted. God has forgiven me for my temper. I will never have another temper tantrum. How's it working for you? Uh, it's not. Okay? It doesn't work for me. You know what the end result is? Craig and me, who were in two separate confessionals next to each other at the same time, we walk out of the church thinking, yes, we are forgiven. We are clean of all our sins. We are sanctified. We, are, we, we rock this whole forgiveness thing. All right? But as Craig gets onto his donkey in old time Rome, he gets cut off by some dune buggy driver. And he lets rip. Gives this oak a total what for. All right? I get to my senate seat or my office, whatever you want to call it in Rome, and some oak didn't do what I want, and I lose my temper. Now Craig and me sit with a bit of a dilemma because, yeah, he, yeah, we were forgiven for swearing, we were forgiven for temper, but now we can't go back to the priest and ask for forgiveness because we've done it. We're supposed to have a hold over this. Do you think that works as a system? Just think about your tiny little sin that you do every day. Renee, cappuccino. Um, <laughs> The scary thing, and this led to what we today understand as being the reformation of the church, is that the whole penance thing led to what we call in the Catholic Church as indulgences. The church got it in its mind that they could sell indulgences to its members. That's why the Catholic Church has got oodles of cash, all right? Because what they used to do is, um, they used to, let's put it this way, Craig and me, we've had our altercations with our staff and our guy in the traffic, and we come off second best. We toast. We're dead. We're no longer there. The Catholic Church now offers Bev and Fiona the opportunity to go and pay for our sins, pay the church for our sins, so that we would be forgiven. In other words, we are forgiven post-mortem for what we have done. Paid cash for it. And this led to Martin Luther standing up and saying, enough is enough, we can't do this. And that was where the reformation of the church actually started, because of the whole indulgence issue. It was one of the key issues. It wasn't all the issues, but one of the key issues. Okay. Now, when we look at the whole concept of repentance, okay, now this is the biblical issue, the whole concept of, of, of biblical repentance. We need to understand that true repentance doesn't depend on what you do, or you do, or I do. It depends on what Jesus did on the cross, and whether I believe in that or not. That's all it is. It really is as simple as that. We make it far more complicated. What I mean by this is that when I've committed a sin, whatever that sin may be, I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit that it's wrong. I need to confess it. I need to bring it before God. Um, and if I don't do that, it's, it's, it's uh, a little like being a ref when you shouldn't be one. You sit with this issue that nobody likes you, you know. <laughs> Try to throw that in somewhere, all right. 
it's that, a little like shouting for the bulls and not realizing it's a sin, all right? Um, it, it, you, know, you know what I mean, all right? We are moved by the Holy Spirit to bring this thing before God. And we bring it before God and we confess Him and God forgives us. We get that. The problem, however, is that for many people, not in this church only, but in churches around the world, for many, many people, their giving and their service and their devotion is the price they pay for their guilt. Get this. So many people are serving God in the church because they feel guilty for what they've done. And get what I'm telling you right now. Nowhere, but nowhere in the Bible does God say, I need to do anything to attain forgiveness. The whole idea, and Dave spoke about it last week, was that forgiveness in my life isn't obtained by what I do, but rather what Jesus did on the cross for me. So let's get back to that other question I asked a bit earlier. How do I know that God forgets my sins? Well, the Bible tells me he does. I will throw it into the sea of my forgetful. I will forget about it. Now, before I go on, let me just clear up one huge, massive misconception with regards to confession. Somewhere in the church teaching, somewhere in our story, in our history, we came to a place where we assumed that confession is all about guilt. I confess because I feel guilty. All right? We come and we confess, and when we confess, I feel relieved because my guilt has been relieved. The trouble is that if you come and you kneel down before that cross and you confess for whatever your sin may be, and you do it from a guilt perspective, then confession is not about God. It's about you. It's all about you. You bring it to God because you want to feel better. We bring it to God because we want to feel better. We confess our sins before God and we feel better. And so confession is something we use to make us feel good about ourselves. It has nothing to do with God and his need for righteousness in your life and in your heart. It's got nothing to do with true repentance of your heart before God. Who of you, be honest, who of you have done that? I've done it. Oh Lord, I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. Ah, I feel better. We've all done it. Whether you like to admit it or not, we have all done it. We confess because we want to feel better. And the problem is, it becomes about me and not God at that point. Many of us seem to measure our, the level of our forgiveness to the level of our relief. So if I'm totally relieved after confessing, well then I'm totally forgiven. If I'm a little bit relieved, well then I'm in here, a little bit forgiven. Which of course creates a whole new set of problems in your life. Because forgiveness doesn't work that way. Alright? Get this. Repentance and confession... And this is hard. But repentance and confession has deadly squat to do with your precious feelings. Scary, but true. It's got nothing to do with the way you feel. It's not about you. It's about him. And it's about you being honest with him. And please, don't try and mock him. Don't try and fool him, because you won't be able to get it right. The picture of true confession simply looks like this. Genuine, real confession, true confession serves. Now, I love that statement. Confession serves. When something serves me, has it got power? No, it doesn't. So the act of confession has no power. All right? The whole concept of confession has no power. It is simply a tool that I have that leads me as the first step towards repentance. I can't repent of something unless I use what God has given me, the tool that God has given me to repent with. And that is confession. There is no spiritual meaning behind confession. It is all about simply me going to God and saying, sorry, truly sorry. This is what I've done. It's the first step towards repentance as in, I will not do it again, Lord. Now, whether you do it or not, that's besides the point. Because God knows whether you will do it or not. Again, that's besides the point. But your heart motive at that point is, Lord, I'm crying. I will not do it again. And it's about reconciliation. It's about restoring your relationship with God. With nobody else at that point, but your relationship with God. And this is what makes confession so very difficult for so many of us. Because I can go before God and I can confess my sins before Him. It's easy. It's very easy for me to do that. But then He says you need to go and find the person that you've wronged and you need to confess that sin to them too. In real terms, what you need to do is you need to confess 
or open your soul to someone other than God. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that I've confessed all my sins. Well, those I can remember, in any case, before God. I've done that. But there are people in the world out there, people in this church, that I still have to confess stuff to. And I honestly don't know if I've got the courage to do it. Because it takes a tremendous amount of courage to do that. Genuine confession, and this is the, the, the statement of the service this morning. Genuine confession leads to genuine change. All right? And that is why God gave us the whole idea of confession. The question we need to ask ourselves is, is simply this. When I have confessed my sins to God and to man, has my life changed? When I've truly spoken to God about what I've done wrong, and I've gone and I've spoken to the person that I've hurt, has my life changed? Now, if you've ever done that, you will realize your life actually has changed. So let's have a quick look at what the, the scriptures tell us about the concept, the idea of confession. And I want to go back, right back to the beginning of the Old Testament. Remember, God comes into Moses' life, says, dude, you need to pull the Israelites out of Egypt. Come along, let's take them. He takes three and a half million people out of Egypt, and they're off into the desert. But God realized that if he didn't put some sort of a structure in place, some sort of rules, then they'll be like a bunch of sheep that follow fire and smoke, and that's all they will do. They won't do anything. So he gives them rules and gives them regulations in terms of what they needed to do, how they needed to live their lives. And one of those rules we find in, in Numbers 5, verses 5 to 6. Uh, we assume Moses is the author of Numbers also. We're not 100% sure, but... This is what he says. The Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way. Okay, first of all, one of the first indications that there's no sliding scale when it comes to sin. Any man or woman who wrongs another in any way. Any way means sin is sin. Suck it up, deal with it. He carries on. He says, in any way. And so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess that sin that they have committed. Now for many of us, we have no problem confessing our sins to God because, well, we assume it's going to stay there. We want it, and in fact, it will stay there unless we do something about it. But the Lord says, nah, -uh, it doesn't work that way. You can confess your sin to me until you're blue in the face. I will forgive you, but you need to make restitution to the people that you have heard. When we do something wrong to another person, get what I'm telling you. Right now, we are not only unfaithful to that person, we are also unfaithful to God. And not only are you guilty in the, in the eyes of the person that you have hurt, you are also guilty in the eyes of God. Now this puts a very different spin on the whole concept of, of confession. Because, and Dave spoke about it last night, uh, uh, last week. If you hold a grudge, if you hold something against somebody, get this. You're sinning against God. You're not just holding a grudge against that person. You're actually sinning against God because you are not forgiving that person. By the same measure that you are forgiven, so I will forgive you. Scary. That's one of the scariest pieces of scripture in the Bible. By the same measure that I forgive you, Del, for instance, so God will forgive me. If I don't forgive you, what is bound in heaven is bound on earth what is loosed in heaven is loosed on earth you know and that's it. so many people miss that piece of scripture we don't get that because we we seem to think yes grace is uh, forgiveness is this blanket thing that just happens but there are conditions to it god gives us very specific specific conditions the author of numbers carries on and he says this, they must make full restitution for the wrong that they have done. Add a fifth of the value to it and give it, to all, give it all to the person that they have wronged. Okay, now all of a sudden confession doesn't become so much fun anymore. All right? It's not so comfortable because now all of a sudden I've got to give back what I did wrong. But not only do I have to give back, I've actually now got to add 20% to it or one fifth to that. And it's easy when we look about good money because we can work out what money uh, uh, how to work out what 20% of a specific amount is. But how do, you, how do you work out what 20% of gossip is? Or slander? How do you work out what a fifth of bullying looks like? Or unfaithfulness? Or abuse? How do you repay that person and make restitution to that person? How do you do that? Seeing as confession in the Old Testament is confession in the New Testament. It's confession today. 
it hasn't changed its precept. And to be honest with you, when I look at this piece of scripture, as I said, there's people I've hurt and there's stuff I've done that I shouldn't have done. How? And I have no idea how to make restitution to them. I, I really, I have no idea how to do it. I don't even know where to start. And I think I'm not the only person in the church this morning that is struggling with this. We have all hurt people. We've all said stuff, taken stuff, done stuff that we shouldn't have done. How do we make restitution? You know, it's simple when you put words like that on paper. But the reality of that is far more difficult. Now, a whole lot of years pass from the Old Testament. The Israelites have crossed over the Jordan. They've put up tents, uh, houses. They've built houses. They're in Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, a young man, 33 years old, pitches up on the scene. Okay, he was a baby before that, and he grew up to be age 33. But he comes onto the scene, and he wanders into Jerusalem one day. And as he's wandering in, he, he, he comes up to he meets somebody who was structurally challenged about Renee's height. Okay. <laughs> All right, Zacchaeus. You remember the story of Zacchaeus? He was a dude who was a tax collector, super wealthy. He had all the money in the world, but he was a tax collector, so he got it by ill-gotten gains. And at this point, he decides, well, you know what? This Jesus thing really seems to be something to it. I need to find out more about it. So he runs down the crowd, climbs into a sycamore tree, and there he sits waiting for Jesus, thinking, well, if I can just see Jesus, everything will be good. But what happens, of course, is totally different. Jesus gets to the sycamore tree and says, yo, Zac, I'm having dinner at your house tonight. The Pharisees in the crowd, of course, have an absolute thrombosis because you're not supposed to be a teacher or rabbi and have mixed with sinners, which technically meant that I shouldn't be mixing with you lot. <laughs> you know, literally, that's what it meant uh, in the Old Testament, in, 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 the, in the Jewish concept. If you were a sinner, I couldn't mix with you. I was unclean. Not because of anything I did, because what you did. When I go home, I've got to go and clean myself. That was literally how it was. That's why the whole concept of Old Testament, uh, the God of the Old Testament and, and the, 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 the understanding of grace and forgiveness in the Old Testament was so complex because they had all these rules and regulations that kept people from really getting into a relationship with God. So, of course, the, the Pharisees will pass out in the road there because this wasn't happening. I mean, when the Bible speaks about sinners, it speaks about, for thou hast, you are a sinner and a tax collector. These dudes were so bad, they had their own category when it came to describing who they were. People hated the tax collectors because they made oodles of cash out of the people. So Zacchaeus goes, brings Jesus into the house. Um, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. There's a whole lot of teachings that go, around, go, go, go through that evening. And at one point, Zacchaeus stands up, Luke 19, verse 8, and he says this, but Zacchaeus stood up and said, give said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, obviously, something radically had happened to the life of Zacchaeus at this point. He had heard Jesus speak. His life had changed. But Scripture calls for restitution. So Zacchaeus decides, well, you know what? This is what the Bible tells me. I'm going to go overboard, okay? So he gives back four times the original installed. He gives back half his possessions to the poor. He literally gives back, he probably still had enough to live, but he literally gives back a huge chunk of his, his wealth. Now listen to Jesus' response, and this is what he says. And Jesus saith unto Zacchaeus, don't get carried away. Next one. Thou hast confessed, and it is enough that thou hast confessed thy sins to me in private. Mano a mano. Okay, now Jesus didn't say that, all right? I just made that up. But I promise you something right now. Many of you would love to hear him say that to you. Keep it private. Just talk to me. It's all over and done with. Don't go and open wounds that are not necessarily needed to be opened. Whatever Jesus said to Zacchaeus had a huge impact on his life. And it changes him radically that he actually walks onto the porch of his house and shouts to the whole of Jerusalem what he was going to do. Radical, violent change in a man's life who meets the true Lord Jesus Christ. Confess our sins and we ask God, uh, uh, but, sorry, when we go and we confess our sins to God, we often ask God to keep it between him and me. And God says, uh -uh, it doesn't work that way. There's three people in this relationship. You, me, and the person that you have hurt. You know what? I'm torn because I need to do this, but I don't know how. Many of you are sitting here and you're torn. You know you need to go and find this person and you need to say to them, look, I'm sorry. Do what you need to do. But you have no idea how to do it. 
Listen to how Jesus really responds to Zacchaeus. Slide number nine. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Jesus didn't say to Zacchaeus, chill out, stop worrying. Don't go open old wounds, just leave it. Let let bygones be bygones. He doesn't say that. He says, no, that's exactly what you need to do. You need to go find those people and you need to make restitution into their lives for what you have done. And, and I think the lesson that Jesus is saying is that if, if you're willing to do that, if you're willing to make sort of that sort of restitution that Zacchaeus was doing, then you're probably not going to steal from them again. All right? And that's the teaching he gives us. In terms of, of restitution, Zacchaeus gives back so much more than he needed to. And it's my experience that you don't give away that sort of money unless there's a change of heart. I'm not going to give my money away to somebody unless something in here tells me to do that. How many of you are just going to give your money away to some beggar? Write a check out for 10,000 rand to some beggar on the road. How many of you will write that same check out if you know without a doubt God is saying do it? Difficult, eh? Very difficult because 10,000 bucks is 10,000 bucks, eh? But God sometimes does that to us. How do you make restitution? Let's have a look at what the, the scriptures tell us. And, and when we open the book of James, we go back to the book of James. Always we seem to end up back there. It's the only time in the Bible where we are commanded to confess our sins to each other. James writes this. He says, therefore, confess. Uh, he doesn't say, therefore, if you feel like it, confess. He says, therefore, confess your sins. Ah, wait a minute. To each other. He doesn't stop there. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. Do you know how much cancer in the world is accredited to unforgiveness these days? Large chunks of it. Do you know how much illness is accredited to the inability to confess and, and, and ask forgiveness from God? A large chunk. And what James is saying here is, go and find the person. Confess to that person. Because once you do that, I promise you, you will start to pray for each other. But not only there, once you start to pray for each other, you will be healed. The question is, why? Why would I want to go and open a wound that is healed? I use that in inverted commas. Why would I want to go and open up a fresh wound? Why would I want to go and confess something to someone that has... He's probably blissfully unaware of what I've done. Why would I want to do this and run run the real risk of destroying a relationship? Why would I want to do that? Well, it's one of the important questions that James actually asks. And he likens it, or or, or the the, the, the people who, who look at the Bible in one of the sections I read, likens it to the following. He says, unconfessed sin is like a splinter under your skin. It doesn't go away. If you leave it there, what happens? It starts to fester. It starts to become putrid. It doesn't go away. In fact, it becomes worse. Ask anybody who has lived with a secret in their life for an extended period of time as to something that they've done. Ask them if they are total peace with themselves. And they will tell you 100% of the time, no, they are not. Every time they come into contact with the person that they have wronged, all this... (coughs) This comes back. It is my experience of this, that you will not find peace until you are willing to confess, genuinely confess your sins to God and to the person that you have hurt. I've avoided it because I had some little dwemini a whole lot of years ago who said to me, Relax, chill out, don't, don't, don't do it. You're going to destroy the relationship. And maybe it's time that I do it. It's time that we, I, I definitely do it. I don't have the courage to do it right now, but it's time that I do it. And for years I just lived with the fact that uh, the Dwemley said it's fine, I can, I can do it. I don't have to confess it to that person. Every time I, I bump into that person, I... It just comes back. I know what I've done. But I haven't got the courage to talk to them. And I know, I know that I'm not the only person in this church this morning who's feeling like that. I know that. James tells us that we are to confess our sins to each other so that we can pray for each other. Why? 
so that we can be healed. It's not healing of cancer. It's not healing of AIDS or some illness. It's the healing of relationship. It's the healing of bringing peace back into that relationship. Yeah, the person on the other side maybe has forgiven you. Maybe they've forgotten about it. I don't know, whatever the reason may be. But you remember it. You're the one that keeps bringing it up in your own life because you haven't dealt with it. Unconfessed sin will destroy your relationships. It will bring discomfort to even the closest relationships. Unconfessed sin is a barrier between you and that person that cannot be scaled. Unconfessed sin will destroy your relationship with your spouse, with your children, with your parents, with your siblings. You know what? The devil loves unconfessed sin. Why? Because if you've got unconfessed sin, he owns you. He owns you. And he has the ability to speak into your life time and time again that will absolutely destabilize you instantaneously. Unconfessed sin is poison to your soul. If you think this is a difficult teaching, wait until until I tell you what I want to tell you now. Following Jesus Christ is violent. It's not for softies. It's not for sissies. It's not for for people who want to be comfortable. If you're going to truly follow Christ Jesus in a furious love relationship, it's going to be violent because there will be tears. There will be blood. There will be hurt. There will be pain. All those things come because you follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not experiencing that right now in your life, then you're playing games with God. Then you're playing games with God. Every night you go and you ask God for the forgiveness of the same sin that you've, you've collected during the day. Next morning you do exactly the same thing. The confession only starts to work when you apply it, when you truly start to apply it. And you stop praying the same old prayers every night. And you start being honest with God. And you start being honest with yourself. Because if you're not, you're a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite. And you're dishonoring God. I have a suggestion for you. I haven't tried this myself. Because I found this on Friday. But I'm going to try it. But I have a suggestion for you. It's something you may not have tried before. Why don't you really, get this, why don't you really pray about this thing that you're struggling with? Okay, who have you prayed about it? Huh? Who have you prayed about this thing that you are battling with in your life? Most of us have. If you've got something, you've prayed about it, okay? Uh, but maybe you should try this prayer. And this, this, I believe, apparently works. Dear Heavenly Father, you saw what I did today. And I just want to tell you this morning that I'm going to keep on doing it. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You know what you're doing? You're being honest with God. You know tomorrow you're going to do the same thing. You're being honest with this. Lord, I I can't. I'm going to do this again tomorrow. I know I'm going to do this again tomorrow. You lie in bed and go, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. I promise you, I promise I will not do this ever again. Tomorrow morning, 7.30, you log on to the computer and you do it. Why not be honest with God? God, I come before you. You know, you saw what I did. I'm going to tell you that I'm probably going to do it tomorrow again. I need your help. I need you to walk with me. Why can't you pray prayers like this? I'll tell you why. Because you're chicken. We're chicken. We're so scared to pray prayers like that. Because when we start to pray prayers like that, that's when God comes and he starts to move. He's not interested in your bulldust. He's not interested in your half lies that you pray to him. He's interested in your honesty. And Lord, uh, sorry, and he said, and if you lie in bed and you say, Lord, listen, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm addicted to alcohol or I'm addicted to porn. And I know tomorrow morning I'm going to go buy a half check on the way to the office or I'm going to log on to hotbabes.com as soon as I get to the office. If you say that to him, you're being honest with him. That is when he starts to work. But as long as you're not honest with him, he cannot work. He will not work. Get what I'm telling you today. The confession app is a scary app. It is a very scary app. It is a scary app because when we engage in confession, honestly, we open ourselves up to the scrutiny of not only God, because he knows everything already, 
but other people too. And God isn't saying, listen, he has all your sins. He has the box, okay? Go find the person, just vomit it out onto their lap. He's not saying that. Because if you do that, I promise you, you're not going to talk to that person again. But God is, you, what God is saying is, come to me. Bring this thing that you haven't confessed. And let me help you open that box just a little bit. Let me help you just open it a little bit. And, and together, every day, we'll open up a little bit more. And a little bit more. And a little bit more. Until that box is open. And you've dealt with it. You know what the problem is for most of us? We fear the consequences. Um, hang on, let me, let me get this right because this is quite important. In closing, for many of us, we do not confess our sins to others because we fear the con- consequences of confession. We are so scared to confess that sin to that person. We far more fear the consequences of confession than we fear the consequences of of concealment. We are far more worried about what this person will say if I admitted to it than what will happen if this thing came out on its own. Now, if any of you have been involved in something that's come out, you've done wrong and it's come out on its own, are the consequences far worse when it comes out and you've been caught out? Or are the consequences far worse if you've gone and you've admitted what you've done? Which consequences are, are, are worse? Consequences of concealment. When that thing comes out, and, and you know what God says in his word? It isn't a slide for it. All sin will be revealed. All sin will be revealed. So you can hide that thing to the nth degree as much as you want. Eventually it's going to be revealed. It's going to come out. We are far more worried about the, the consequences of, of confession than we are about the consequences of concealment. You know what, some of you, maybe this morning you're there. Maybe you're ready to do this. I take my hat off to you. Some of us aren't. But one of the prayers I'm starting to pray to God is, God, crack this box open. Just a little bit. Just a wee bit. And let some of that stuff out so that I can deal with it. And I can be honest with that person. Because I've been honest with you a long time ago. But I need to be honest with that person. And that's the prayer we ask God. Don't worry about the healed wound. If God is in this thing, that that wound will heal immediately. The confession app. It's not a game. And this sermon spoke to me in a very big way, as I'm hoping it's spoken to you today. But it's not a game. We treat it as a game. We cheapen grace. We, We use it to get what we want out of it. It's a gift that God gave us. But it's a gift that requires courage. And it's a gift that has given us the courage. Or he gives us courage with it. And it's a gift that requires backbone. And it's going to be a gift that requires forgiveness. Let us pray. Father God, in the deepest recess of our hearts... You know what's going on there. In the deepest, darkest part of our heart today, the things we have, well, apparently successfully hidden, they're there. And Lord, I just, I come before you this morning, and Lord, and as you've spoken to me, I pray that you would speak to your people today too. Give us the courage to go and confess, not only to you, but to the people we have hurt, that we may speak to them that we may tell them what we've done. Father, that you may begin to help us to pray for each other and then heal us, as your word says. I pray, Father, not only for for us as, as your children who need to confess, but I pray for the hearts of the people that we would confess to, that they would see Jesus in this act. They would see you in this act. That they won't hold grudges. They won't... uh, hold something against those people and us who, who have to do that. Maybe it's our boss. Maybe it's our children. Maybe our parents or our siblings or our spouse. Maybe it's a friend. But Father, we just come before you and we put these people before you and we ask that you would deal in their lives too, just as much as you're dealing in our lives. May we clear the air, clean it up, 
and be ready to do what you've called us to do. Father, we pray this all in your holy and wonderful name. Amen. Jason, where's Leslie? Leslie? Okay, this may take a while.